Hey everyone, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as the human embodiment of curdled milk, and this is a segmented, single-player, no SLA speedrun of Portal 2. This run is performed by M. Sushi, a top runner for this category who also helped me write the script to make sure it's all as accurate as possible. If you'd prefer to watch either this run without commentary or M. Sushi's current personal best, they're both linked in the description. So this category is considered to be the main speedrun category for Portal 2 by its speedrunning community, and the category name has that weird thing at the end of it that says no SLA. SLA stands for Save Load Abuse, which pretty much boils down to you can do some pretty messed up stuff to the game when you save and load, and that's just overall disallowed in this category. In addition to that, you're not allowed to go out of bounds in this category at all. You have to stay in bounds the whole time. That all being said, glitches are still allowed in this category, so if that isn't your cup of tea, I've also linked the current no major glitches record in the description, which M Sushi holds the record for. So if you've never played Portal 2 before, it's a first-person puzzle platform game where you play as Shell, a test subject for an organization named Aperture Science. At the end of the first game, you escape but are dragged back inside by the party escort bot as the screen fades to black. Portal 2 takes place at some indeterminate point a long time after the events of Portal where Shell wakes up from suspended animation in a stasis chamber with Aperture Science now being incredibly dilapidated and on the verge of collapse. Over the span of 9 chapters, we control Shell as we attempt to escape the decrepit Aperture Science, solving a series of puzzles along the way with our handy dandy portals. So this run was actually suggested and voted on by my patrons to be covered on the channel, so be sure to say thank you to them in the comments, and you can take part in future suggestions and polls like this for as little as $1 a month, but more on that at the end of the video. Also, real quick, we here at Tomato Anus recently covered the Any% percent run of Portal 1, which is available for viewing on this channel. It's not at all necessary to watch that run before watching this one, especially because that run relies heavily on save load abuse, which this category disallows, but figured I'd give anyone unaware a heads up regardless. Alright, with all that covered, let's get it previously on Tomato Anus. Huh, Roman times. Alright, I'm done now. Oh, hey, Minnesota guy, what are you doing in the quicksand up to your waist room? Oh, just spending some time with my thoughts, don't you know? Oh, what are you thinking about? Vehicle combat. Hey, that reminds me. Have you ever played the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, War Thunder? Oh, you betcha. I'm gonna keep talking about it anyways. I'll join ya. Isn't it crazy how the vehicles in War Thunder span over 100 years of development, from the swinging 20s to today with over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships to play as in combined arms PvP battles? Yeah, especially with how every vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components. Really makes the vehicle combat more immersive. I think one of my favorite things about it is that you don't need any extra pilot hardware either. Don't need an at-home cockpit or anything, just your controller or mouse and keyboard. Hey, uh, Chicago guy? You can play War Thunder on PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X or S, or previous console generations. Chicago guy, I think there might be a sinkhole under the quicksand up to your waste room. If you register using the link in the description, you get a large free bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and more. Minnesota guy? So to start the run, M. Sushi first needs to start a new game, which he does by moving his cursor over to where it says New Game and then clicking on New Game. As I said in the intro, the game opens up with Shell waking up in a stasis chamber resembling a motel room in the dilapidated ruins of Aperture Science. We're guided through this intro sequence by a personality core named Wheatley who will guide us through the test chambers once we get through the intro. This big intro sequence lasts right around 5.5 minutes, and technically, the run begins at the end of it, with runners typically starting runs there by loading a pre-made save, but how can I turn down extra runtime in this video to explain things? While M. Sushi pilots us along the auto-scroller of an intro, let's get into a few pieces of tech. First, let's talk a little about movement. So if you hold a directional key to move and just move that one direction, you have a walking and jumping speed limit of 175 units. This can be surpassed when you're in air though by doing something called an air strafe. Air strafing is performed by jumping and while in air, holding either A or D to move left or right and turning the camera in the same direction as the key you're pressing. This lets you gain speed and, as I said, lets you go above the speed cap of 175 units. With this being a speedrun and us wanting to go as fast as possible, then inherently it would make sense that we want to be air strafing as much as possible whenever we're just moving around without doing any crazy portal shenanigans. This is where bunny hopping comes in. M. Sushi has jump bound to his scroll wheel so that he can jump continuously by just scrolling a little bit whenever he lands, that way he can spend as much time in the air as possible to air strafe and maximize speed. When he's doing this, because he's air strafing, he isn't holding W at all, just A or D for whichever direction he's strafing. 
Additionally, the first jump in a bunny hop chain is actually what's called a circle jump, where he does a quick strafe by jumping and flicking his camera to a side while holding that directional key. The big thing about bunny hopping in this game though is that when either your horizontal or vertical velocities exceed 300 units, which you can see the values of thanks to the CL show pause command in the top left corner, you lose control over player direction. You'll typically hit a velocity of 300 units within your second jump in a bunny hop chain, so if you want to change directions, you need to land and be on the ground for something like 0.1 to 0.2 seconds so that your speed drops momentarily. This means that bunny hopping in Portal 2 is a lot more control oriented than speed oriented. Bunny hopping with air strafing is used a lot throughout the run, but a variation of it is when you do something called speed wall strafing. If you have a long straightaway with a wall you can hug the entire way, then by being against the wall and holding the directional key that's in the wall's direction, and also looking in the direction opposite the wall, you consistently gain speed when you jump, since you're kinda just non-stop air strafing with the wall holding you in place. Moving on from portal list movement, another piece of tech is something called a re-portal. So if you're standing inside of your portals and you attempt to shoot a new portal, naturally, the game isn't a fan of that, so the game tries to push you out of the portals. Speedrunners often use this to their advantage by either standing or moving through portals and shooting a new one as they pass through, causing the game to push them out which gives them a little speed boost. So pretty much a re-portal is shooting a portal while you're standing or moving through portals and using the game pushing you out of the portals to your advantage. Related to re-portals is something called a portal stand. This is where the runner stands inside of their portals and shoots a new one, but they press S to counteract the game pushing them out so they stay inside of the portals and are essentially relocated to the new portal location. So portal stand equals standing in a portal, shooting a new portal, and fighting against the game when it tries to push you out so that you stay in the portals and are relocated to the new one's location, while again, re-portals are when you let the game push you out of the portal and use that push slash speed boost to your advantage. If you've watched my video covering Portal 1, portal stands might sound similar in concept to something in that run called a portal peak or a peak a portal, and that's because they have very similar results. Portal peaks slash pika portals as we know from Portal 1 aren't a thing in this game though, mainly because while in Portal 1, your portal shots had linear travel time where your shots would actually travel through the air before landing at their destination, Portal 2 has hit scan where the game scans if you shot a valid target and if so, applies the portal instantly. There is something in Portal 2 called the pika portal, though that's entirely different, but I'll cover what that is later in the run. So the last thing I'll go over before we get to the run proper is how elevators and transitioning between levels work. A good majority of the elevators in this game are set up where as you travel in the elevator to the next level, you pass through a series of triggers that check to see if the level dialogue has ended. If the dialogue is over when you hit one of these triggers, then the screen fades out and you load into the next level. If the level's dialogue hasn't ended though, then the elevator keeps moving down until you hit the next trigger, where the game again checks if the dialogue is over so that it can transition you to the next level. This goes on and on in the elevator shaft until you hit a failsafe at the end of the shaft, where the game will force load you into the next level, regardless of the status of the dialogue. These triggers are evenly spaced, with them typically being around half a second to a second apart, but with some later in the game being a full second and a half apart. If you just hop into an elevator with no care as to when you do it in relation to the level dialogue, then it's likely that the dialogue will end at some point between triggers, with there being a certain amount of dead time between when the dialogue ends and you hit the next trigger. As speedrunners, we want to minimize this dead time and avoid scenarios where dialogue might end right after passing a trigger, meaning that we have a full distance of dead time to the next trigger before the level can end. Because the distance between triggers is known for all applicable elevators, speedrunners have been able to route out what points in each applicable level's dialogue they should step into the elevator so that the dialogue ends just before they hit a trigger and dead time is minimized. This is why at many points throughout the run, you'll see M. Sushi finish a chamber but wait a few moments before stepping in the elevator. He's waiting for the dialogue to get to a point where it'll end as soon as he's about to hit a trigger. Additionally, because there's a series of triggers that you hit as you travel in the shaft, that means that there's not just one right time in each line of dialogue to get in the elevator. There's multiple points in most lines of dialogue when you can step in, since there are multiple points in the dialogue that sync up with the dialogue ending right as you're about to pass a trigger. For example, with this line of dialogue, you can step into the elevator after the word alone, in the middle of constructs, or in the middle of apocalyptic, and stepping in at any of these points will sync up the line ending with right as you're about to hit a trigger. Here's a comparison of M. Sushi stepping onto the elevator at these three points and him also stepping on at a bad time, which demonstrates how runners routing out the different points they can enter the elevator gives them a bit of leeway if they complete the level faster or slower. Additionally, in a lot of chambers, the end dialogue is so long that runners prioritize activating the end dialogue as early as possible, as opposed to solving the chamber as early as possible, just so that the dialogue is as close to done as possible by the time they get to the elevator. Overall,
overall, if you don't account for all this info about when you should step into the elevator and just step in at a random point in the level dialogue, you can lose what M Sushi estimates to be up to 30 seconds throughout the run thanks to the added dead time. That's about it for tech for now, but just so you know, throughout the run, in addition to keeping track of the chapters as they're completed, I'm also going to be keeping track of the chambers as we complete them as well. I'll be tracking this with these circles that will fill up with each chamber completion, with me only showing the total number of chambers that are in the chapter we're in at that given moment. Alright, I hope you got all that tech, because there will be a quiz later on one of them. Hope you were taking notes, and oh wow, look, all that preamble lined up absolutely perfectly with the start of the run, which officially is when the portal opens in this chamber. M Sushi begins by bunny hopping so he has momentum as the portal opens, and in this first chamber he's going to do a dialogue skip by first pressing the button without the cube, then placing the cube on the button, and then crossing the fizzler when the announcer says emergency, which skips a line of dialogue and saves 6 seconds. You have just passed through an Aperture Science Material Emancipation Grill, which vaporizes most Aperture Science equipment that touches it. So the first four levels or so of Portal 2 are chambers from Portal 1 but remade. Portal Carousel is a remake of a chamber, but instead of the portals cycling on their own, you have to hit buttons to make them cycle. M Sushi makes quick work of this by solving the level in the intended manner, except with bunny hopping instead of just walking normally. Once he gets to the door with the fizzler, the ending dialogue for the chamber begins, which lasts around 20 seconds. This is the first example of the whole elevator fade thing I talked about a moment ago, which M Sushi employs by waiting for a moment and stepping into the elevator during the word associate. Relaxation vault at the conclusion of testing. Please take a moment to write down the results of your test. An Aperture Science Reintegration Associate will revive you for an interview when society has... This brings him to the third chamber in the game, Portal Gun, which, and I know this is hard to believe, is where he'll get the Portal Gun. He bunny hops through this chamber to the Portal Gun stand, which was converted into a remarkably cost-inefficient collapse the floor button, but he bunny hops off this slope on the left when he lands to gain a ton of speed. After grabbing the Portal Gun up here, which has M Sushi's custom skin that he unlocked for being 5th Prestige, he shot a couple portals to quickly navigate deeper into the chamber, installs before dropping into the next room here. By entering when Wheatley says wait, the announcer and Wheatley try to talk over each other, but Wheatley wins, skipping 10 seconds of announcer dialogue at the end of the chamber. Android has not respected your rights as detailed in the laws of robotics. Please note it on your self-reporting form. A future Aperture Science Entitlement Association. This next level, Smooth Jazz, is M Sushi's favorite in the run. He's first going to be doing something called the Laser Switch Glitch, where if you push up against a door when whatever trigger activates to open it, such as the cube on this button, then the cube doesn't need to stay on the button for longer than a single tick, since the door will stay open so it doesn't crush us as we push against it. As Smooth Jazz begins playing, M Sushi shoots a portal next to the exit and bangs the cube against the door at the portal's edge, causing the door to open. Because of a bit of overlap in the portal and door hitboxes, the cube experiences portal bubble physics when colliding with the door, letting it partially clip through and make the game think the cube is stuck behind the door, so the game opens the door to prevent a soft lock. The ability to clip the cube through solid objects like this only applies to thinner barriers like doors and glass, but not things like walls. In this chamber, he's going to do the first portal stand of the run after pressing this button, using it to relocate to a floor button where he uses portals to grab the cube, which he places on the button to leave. To leave the level then, he enters the elevator during the word constructs for the elevator fade timing. Personality constructs will remain functional in apocalyptic, low-power environments of as few as 1.1 volts. Next is Future Starter, where M Sushi is going to do something super similar to the last chamber by portal standing to get across the area, shooting a portal under the cube, and shooting a portal in front of him to grab the cube through as it falls out of the other portal. In the second part of the chamber, he's going to do something called the button glitch, where by doing a precise lineup and stepping on the floor button for exactly one tick, the button activates to move the panel blocking the exit without having to place the cube on it. Important to note that you can't button glitch every button in the game, at least when you can't save and load like in this category, and the reason that it works with this button is that the panels blocking the exit that the button activates have too many entities. When the panels are turned on and off in one tick, the game just can't do that many things at once that quickly, and the panels stay down. After going through the portal he'll shoot to start this next chamber, M Sushi is going to perform something called the pancake shot, where by having a precise angle set up, he can shoot a portal through a hole in the texture of the far large industrial door that's thinner than a pancake. The angle to shoot the portal through the hole in the texture is precise down to the second decimal place, so you really need to butter up to fit your portal through. This saves around a minute, since this is usually where you talk with Wheatley, get him off his management rail, and start carrying him around, but we skip all that, so thankfully we won't have him chirping in our ear over the next few levels, letting us bunny hop to the next level in peace.
Jesus Christ, Wheatley, what the hell? Guess I was wrong. Turns out the game doesn't check between chambers if story conditions have been met, so Steven Merchant is in our inventory now. So this chamber is called Wake Up and is one of the bigger cutscene maps in the game, which consists of us passing by the corpse of GLaDOS as we attempt to escape with Steven. We're going to go down to a control panel to look for an escape pod and plug Steven in to figure it out, but we end up done goofing and reactivating GLaDOS and getting back on the normal testing track. When M Sushi plugs Steven into the control panel pod thing, he's going to jump on top of and off of Steven's noggin to get on top of the pod, which is the beginning of a skip called Bet's Rider. As part of the cutscene, Steven is going to begin raising the pod as we're on it, and when it reaches the top, M Sushi is going to pause the game and then jump on the first frame after unpausing. Pausing always stops the game on an odd numbered tick, and for some reason, specific physics interactions only work on odd numbered ticks. He's going to jump as soon as he unpauses on the odd numbered tick, which in addition to the rising speed he'll have from the pod, will cause M Sushi's jump to have a huge speed boost, letting him go over an invisible wall. Pausing and jumping like this is called a pause boost. You can perform this without pausing, but it's relatively random and hard that way, and pausing makes it consistent. Maybe that's an understatement. The jump is really stupid without pause boosting, with fewer than 15 runners having completed individual level runs with a pauseless jump in it. Like, if it weren't for pause boosting, this skip wouldn't be done in the full run. When he gets out of the pod, he'll be able to freely move around the chamber while Sheldon J. Plankton's wife Karen powers up. And the next step of Bet's Rider is to grab a clipboard, which has the Krabby Patty secret formula written on it, place it on top of the incinerator, preferably face down so that Karen can't read it, and stand on top of the clipboard. M Sushi is then going to get yanked across the room back in place in the pod for more of the cutscene, but this part of the cutscene is actually the only point in the entire game where you lose full control over your player, with the game also making the player invincible so that they don't die during the cutscene in any way. Additionally, when he's yanked into position for the cutscene, it's just his camera getting yanked, with his player model still staying on top of the clipboard. You'll actually be able to see a little blue dot above the clipboard when we're brought by the incinerator, which is a particle from the player model's portal gun. When the incinerator then opens, the clipboard, secret formula, and player model all go tumbling down, and the player model hits the trigger to end the level 6 seconds before we would by just being dropped by Karen. So overall, Bet's Rider saves 6 seconds. If we had just stood on the incinerator without the clipboard, then we would rotate out to the side with the incinerator doors when they open, whereas props like the clipboard don't follow the same physics as the player, so it stays in place in the center with the player model on top of it. Additionally, because he'll hit the end of level trigger in the incinerator early, M Sushi ends the cutscene before the game has a chance to end the cutscene state. Because the game never gets to properly end the cutscene, it also never gets to properly remove the cutscene invincibility, so for the rest of the run, M Sushi will be invincible. He can't take damage, he can't die. That's what invincible means. Overall, being invincible is a lot more of a quality of life thing than a crutch that runners rely on, but it does allow for a handful of strats later on in the run that end up saving around 20 seconds total. When he eventually lands, M Sushi will bunny hop through the incinerator into the next room where he'll hug the wall on the right to grab the dual portal gun without GLaDOS removing the rubble on top of it. He'll hesitate a moment before grabbing it and portal standing across the level which times it out so that GLaDOS says there as if she had just spotted the portal gun when we're deeper in the level which skips a different line of dialogue. Around here somewhere. Once you find it, we can start testing, just like old time. Good. You have the dual portal to there. But the important thing is you're back with me. And now I'm on to all your little tricks. So there's nothing to stop us from testing for the rest of your life. Now that he's equipped with the double duty portal provider, he's on his way to chapter 2, the cold boot, where he's back on GLaDOS's normal testing track. The first chamber in this chapter is Laser Intro, where rather than solve the puzzle, M Sushi is going to just shoot a portal high on the left wall and hop into a portal on the ground to fling himself to the exit above. The early levels in this chapter are fairly simple, and the dexterous double duty portable portal provider is just really strong. We'll be finishing a lot of these chambers so quickly that we'll be cutting off GLaDOS' lines a lot with completing chambers, which I'm sure she just loves. Laser Stairs is also really easy. Using our dexterous designer double duty portable precision portal provider, he goes up high to shoot a portal to the floor at the end, then portals under the cube, grabs the cube, and puts it on the button. He then heads down to the elevator where he'll wait just a moment for some dialogue to line up for the elevator fade before stepping in, and oh baby, we're cooking with gas now. So the next chamber is dual lasers, where there's two laser receivers you're supposed to redirect two lasers into, but M Sushi is going to do it with just one. Real quick, something worth mentioning is that if you have a portal with a laser coming out of it, and then you shoot a new portal to relocate where the laser is aiming, then because of how portals decay when a new one is opened, there's a tick where the laser is coming out of both the old and new portal locations. This is actually 
actually where the laser switch glitch was originally discovered, and while it's often used to describe the idea that doors won't close on you after something activates it for a tick, it was discovered and named after this application. Now that that's covered, Msushi is going to utilize this laser out of both portals while decaying mechanic to activate both receivers at once for just a tick so that GLaDOS's end of level dialogue begins, and then again while pressed up against the door which thanks to the laser switch glitch caused the door to stay open since he was moving into it during the tick both receivers were active. This is just a taste of what the devilishly designed dexterous double duty potent portable precision portal provider has to offer. The next chamber is Laser Over Goo, which is our 13th chamber overall, and fun fact, 13 is canonically the favorite number of me. Right away, Msushi will portal across the chamber to grab a cube, toss it through the portal, re-portal as he passes through himself, and grab the cube out of the air as he re-portals to place on the button and leave the level. And again, re-portaling is him shooting a portal as he passes through the portals to use the game pushing him out of the portals as a speed boost. There's a bit of irony with GLaDOS's line here as earlier she asked us to slow down while the chambers are still reassembling, but here she says that for the record, we don't have to go that slow, despite us beating the chamber so fast we cut off her chamber intro dialogue. And although I am the very model of a modern major general, I'm going to go back to calling it just the portal gun now. In this chamber, Msushi detaches this wall camera and drops it through the portal so it falls on the floor button on the other side of the chamber, with the end of level dialogue starting as long as a physics object is on the button. After grabbing the cube as it falls, he does a cube jump to be able to reach the portal on the wall to skip having to ride the faith plate back. Even though he started the dialogue early, he still has to wait a moment before exiting the elevator because it's just that long, but starting the dialogue early saves around 10 seconds. The next chamber is Trust Fling, which starts with GLaDOS saying she'll be right back since she has to go to the wing made entirely of glass and pick up 15 acres of broken glass. Right away, Msushi shoots a portal on the far right edge of a wall across the room, and after riding some faith plates as intended, he's going to just land on the sloped wall that he's supposed to use to redirect himself with portals. He'll shoot a portal beneath him to fall through the blue portal he shot on the far right edge and strafe to the end walkway where he'll activate a pedestal button. This causes Garbage to shoot into the chamber and ride the faith plate, so after dicking around on a faith plate himself, he'll line up the portal so the refuse will shoot down onto the floor button. Among the rubbish is a ball that can weigh down floor buttons, so by pressing himself against the exit door, then even though the ball bounces off the button after landing on it, the door stays open thanks to the laser switch glitch. GLaDOS will then say that Shell smells like smelly garbage, and Shell doesn't respond because GLaDOS has a room in her house literally filled with garbage water. Robots that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Also, this elevator is an example of the end dialogue being so long that it's faster to just hop in the elevator and ride it down to hit the failsafe. This brings us to Pit Flings, where Msushi is going to do a glitch called a Super Reportal. Normal reportals work by being in a portal's hitbox and firing another portal to gain speed. If you get stuck in a portal though, you can compound these speed boosts for a huge boost, which is what a Super Reportal is. By looking at a specific angle and walking straight backwards, Msushi will get stuck in the blue portal's hitbox, shoot it elsewhere so he doesn't fall through, and shoot 5 orange orange portals while stuck to shoot himself up at breakneck speeds. As he often has to do in this game, he then has to wait for the end of level dialogue to finish, so he takes this time to show us best waifu. Keep in mind though that forbidden fruit tastes the sweetest, as if you picked it up, a new line of dialogue would start and the game would softlock. In the next chamber, which is named Fizzler Intro, Msushi is going to complete the level in the exact way the devs intended. While the chamber is assembling itself, you can shoot beneath the floor under the Fizzler to redirect the laser on the other side to hit the receiver and complete the room. If Aperture hadn't skimped on the floor joists, you might still be watching this puzzle be solved this very second. So if Chapter 1 is setting the table and Chapter 2 is whetting your appetite, then Chapter 3 is when you realize you ordered an entree instead of an appetizer and now have two dinner portions coming your way. The first chamber in this chapter, Ceiling Catapult, requires us to stand on a faith plate and get launched up three times as GLaDOS makes remarks about our weight as she calibrates the faith plate. There's a trigger in the air above the faith plate that counts how many times the player enters it, with the level progressing after you enter the trigger for the third time. Msushi is going to use the faith plate, and just when the player model crosses the bottom of the trigger, he's going to crouch so that he's entirely out of the trigger, and as he travels upward, he then enters the trigger again. After he reaches the peak of the launch and starts falling, then as soon as he falls entirely out underneath the trigger, he'll uncrouch so that Shell's head breaks the plane again, meaning he hits the trigger three times in just one launch, so the level will progress immediately and we don't have to deal with GLaDOS's chicanery. This is going to happen so quickly that, honestly, I wouldn't believe you if you said you noticed it at home. Tell me in the comments that you notice it. I dare you. I'm just gonna dislike the comment. After the trigger stuff, GLaDOS will lower some panels which will give Msushi line of sight on a wall that he'll shoot a portal on. He'll stand on the faith plate and after the ceiling lowers and he shoots a portal on it, he'll get launched up and perform a Pika portal. See, told you I'd cover this later. 
So in this game, Shell's character model has two important points. Her core position, which is in her torso and kind of like where she's actually located, and then her camera position, which is in her head and where the portals shoot from. A peek -a portal is when you're traveling upwards and about to go through a ceiling portal, and once Shell's head is through the portal but her core position isn't, you shoot the same color portal as the one you're coming out of in a different location. When her core position then travels upwards through the ceiling portal, it and Shell as a whole come out of the new portal location that you just shot. This happens much, much faster than this animation I made and is a pretty tight window to perform successfully and in real time looks like this. He uses this Pika portal to fling himself up in the air and is able to press an elevated button and also be able to reach a laser redirection cube. So again, here M Sushi will launch on the faith plate and crouch on the way up to hit the trigger twice, then uncrouch on the way down after exiting the trigger. He'll shoot a portal up here once GLaDOS lowers the wall and he gains line of sight, and then he'll perform a Pika portal on the faith plate with a portal on the soon to be lowered ceiling. After pressing the button, bonking his head on the cube dropper to be at the right height and grabbing the laser redirection cube, he's going to bunny hop to gain speed into a portal and re-portal as he falls through, launching him up to the exit where he fires one more portal to line up the laser with the receiver to open the exit. Like an eagle, piloting a blimp. So none of you can make fun of the way I say the name of the next chamber. I get enough of that in real life from my friends. This chamber is named Ricochet, and after bunny hopping into the chamber, M Sushi will re-portal over to the cube, launch both himself and the cube way in the air, and position a portal so the cube flies up on the path to the exit. He'll launch off the faith plate at the perfect time to grab the cube and slope off the panels while they're at the perfect angle after having been briefly disconnected by the cube blocking their laser. Unfortunately, he couldn't nail the swag strat of yossing the cube perfectly onto the button and had to fix the cube's position. There's actually a Steam achievement called Overclocker for beating this chamber in under 60 seconds, and due to the missed cube toss, M Sushi was able to finish it just under the wire to get the achievement, with a total time of 22 seconds. Chamber 20 of the run is aptly named Bridge Intro, as it's the first level to feature hard light bridges, which are just floors that go through portals. He's going to navigate this chamber mostly as intended, but just super fast, with him knowing exactly where to place all the portals to reach the cube. And to place the cube on the button, he places a portal next to some glass and can just push the cube through the glass and onto the button. This is another application of what I talked about back in Smooth Jazz, where you can push the cube through thin barriers due to how hitboxes overlap when a portal's next to the barrier. For an upcoming test. Do you know who else murders people who are only trying to help them? Did you guess sharks? Because that's wrong. The correct answer is nobody. Nobody but you is that pointless. In Bridge of the Gap, there's a door to the left up the stairs that breaks, with GLaDOS having to spend time fixing it, but M Sushi will bunny hop through before it closes. He'll then hit a button to drop a cube, shoot a portal on the wall behind the cube dropper, re-portal himself through that portal, grab the cube out of midair, and bunny hop on the middle part to reach the end of the level where he places the cube on the button to exit. Just wow. In fact, you did so well. I'm going to note this on your file in the commendation section. Oh, there's lots of room here. Did well. Enough. Perfect. So turret intro is the next chamber and is where we're introduced to turrets. This level is super flashy, but honestly is nothing more than just shooting portals to navigate the level super quickly. No portal stands, no re-portals, just portals. And keep in mind that M Sushi is invincible during this, but he's traveling so fast that the turrets couldn't even shoot him if they wanted to. Which, uh, I mean, I guess they do want to, because they're turrets. So laser relays is relatively straightforward. It starts off with M Sushi being below the floor as GLaDOS constructs the chamber, and while he's waiting, he does his best impression of Wilson W. Wilson Jr. with peeking his line of sight just high enough to be able to see into the chamber and shoot two portals. He shoots them in two specific spots so that once the chamber is all assembled, he's able to just grab the laser redirect cube and line up all the lasers perfectly. After bunny hopping to the elevator, he has to wait for a bit while GLaDOS talks about how she has a belated birthday present for us. Excuse me, I meant to say belated birthday medical experiment in the form of a present. Well, technically, it's a medical experiment. What's important is it's a present. This chamber is the first time that M Sushi is going to use a strat that would not be possible without invincibility. You're intended to spend this level setting up a bunch of light bridges to block turrets from shooting you, but he's instead going to just bunny hop around the level and jump off a turret here to grab the cube. All he needs to do then is place it on the button and portal to the finish. This strat that's only possible while invincible saves around one second. We then get to listen to GLaDOS talk about how she found a man and a woman with the same last name as us in cryogenic storage. 
There's no way that's at all related to the surprise she's preparing for us, though. No way, no how. In Laserverse Turret, you're supposed to redirect lasers to destroy the turrets, but we're, uh, kinda invincible. First he shoots a portal on the ground near a button, then one on a wall near the cube, and after bunny hopping to the cube, he goes through the portal to place it on the button. This activates a laser that fires through the portal he placed on the ground, which he redirects with this cube to hit the receiver and lower the panels blocking the path. And after threatening to fizzle this turret, Emsushi decides to spare it to send a message to all the other turrets that they better know who they're messing with. <laughs> So in Pull the Rug, there's a laser that activates an elevator to the exit, with a button being on the ground to open the exit. There's a cube that's blocking the laser initially, and after repositioning a light bridge, M. Sushi relocates the cube to be blocking the laser on the other bridge, positioned above the button. He shoots a portal to move the bridge to unblock the laser and drop the cube on the button, activating both the elevator and the exit door. GLaDOS then reassures us that she hasn't forgotten about our surprise, and alludes to what our surprise is by saying, After all these years, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. This brings us to Chapter 4, The Surprise, which we start off with the titular surprise. Initiating surprise in 3, 2, 1. I made it all up. Surprise. Oh, it's nothing. That's a bummer. So for Column Blocker, we're going to perform a skip called Chorus Fruit Skip. The skip starts with M. Sushi standing on his orange portal and performing what's called a seam shot. This is where he lines up his reticle in a super precise location and is able to shoot a portal through a seam in the environment that's created by a bug in the ray tracing algorithm. He's going to do this to get his blue portal into the observation room above the chamber and more importantly, above the exit. In the observation room, he's then going to shoot his orange portal on the ceiling across the room and the blue portal on the ceiling above him. Something to note about observatory rooms is that for whatever reason, there's a big invisible clip at the floor in their models, meaning that the first third or so of the height of the room is an invisible step stool. Using this invisible step stool, he's able to poke his head through the ceiling, but just like with a Pika portal, just his head is through while his core position is not. He's then going to jump and perform a tick-perfect portal shot to a spot on the wall that's directly above the exit, which positions him so that his camera is in bounds but his body is inside of the wall. It's important to note that inside the wall does not count as out of bounds, so this is totally allowed by the rules of this run's category. He's then going to shoot a portal on the wall in front of him, which calls a function called Find Closest Passable Space, or FCPS for short. Maybe you've heard of it. The conditions for FCPS to be called are complicated, but for our purposes with this video, FCPS will sometimes run when the player is stuck, with its purpose being to get the player unstuck. In this specific example, FCPS warps him straight downward and into the exit, skipping the entire chamber. This technically clips us through and out of bounds space and into the exit, but Shell never actually goes out of bounds at all. She's instantaneously relocated to the exit hall, so again, this is allowed by the category's rules. It's important to note though that this skip requires invincibility, because if you don't have it, then you die instantly when FCPS is called. Also, in case you're wondering, it's called Chorus Fruit Skip for two reasons. The first being that it's named after the Chorus Fruit in Minecraft, which warps the player and this skip warps the player downwards, and the second being because the Portal speedrunning community likes naming things after food. I mean, just look at this list of things named after food. So after Chorus Fruit Skip, when M. Sushi enters the elevator, he's going to line up a precise angle value, crouch, and walk backwards into a specific nook in the elevator which causes him to fall out when the door opens, skipping the elevator ride as he hits the trigger below. This clip is possible on every elevator in the game, but is only faster with this one since the elevator ride has a special cutscene at the end. Additionally, the elevator clip is super annoying due to the fact that it doesn't work on certain ticks, so you can do all the correct inputs, but if you start on different ticks, you can have different outcomes. It's probably the biggest run killer for that reason. Also, it's called Jerry Skip because it skips a 35 second cutscene where Steven Merchant talks about how he got a job on the Nanobot team with a Nanobot named Jerry. Alright, let's see Chorus Fruit Skip and Jerry Skip play out in real time. So I very seriously doubt they'd even want to see you. Hey, how's it going? I told. To start laser chaining, he's going to grab a cube to the right at the start and portal up above the laser. 
There he'll line up the cube and drop it so it lands perfectly to line up the relay across the room. After grabbing the next cube, he'll drop it for a moment to shoot a new portal as he gets launched by the faith plates, and at the top, he lines up the redirection cube and laser to light up the remaining relays. He then goes through his portal above the faith plates again to use them to launch himself up so he can air strafe to the exit. He then has to wait a second or two after the elevator opens up before he can get in for the elevator fade thingy. Moving on to triple laser, in this chamber there's three laser receivers you need to activate to leave. M Sushi will walk into the exit door and wiggle his mouse to have the laser activate all the receivers momentarily, which lets him go through the door thanks to the laser switch glitch, and he'll then activate them all again real quick to activate the end dialogue. Man, what the hell is going on with my audio? I'm starting to think that GLaDOS' surprise wasn't nothing at all. I think she might have given me malware. Uh, no, no time for that now, though. In jailbreak, we're busting out of here with the help of Steven Merchant, which were... Ah, damn it, she did give me malware. Okay, just give me one sec. Come on. Just give me one more second, I swear. Alright, I'll deal with the malware later. Let's just try and get through the run. Hopefully nothing malware-related will come up or mess with anything before I can finish explaining this all. Getting back to the run, just like how you got to see behind the scenes of my computer, this is where the player goes behind the scenes of Aperture and breaks out of the testing sequence with the help of Steven Merchant, aka the Og Monster from The Office. After first progressing through the chamber by pressing a pedestal button, he'll position his portal so one is on the panel the Og Monster will move out of the way, and the other above. So when he stands in the portals and the bottom one disappears from the wall being moved, he drops from the above portal to get into the Og Monster's area, skipping having to wait for a light bridge. The rest of this chamber is then going to be M Sushi bunny hopping to the exit, and along the way he's going to get what's called a stair boost, where if you jump off of stairs, you sometimes get a boost, which he uses to cut a corner up ahead. Alright, that's what's happening now, we're escaping. Uh, so you're doing great, just keep running. Uh, quick word about the future plans that I've got in store. Yeah. We're gonna shut down her turret production line, alright? Turn off her This next chamber, well, I guess it's more just a level than a testing chamber, is called Escape, and is the last part of Chapter 4. This level is really just movement stuff with M Sushi bunny hopping most of the way and only ever using portals once. And remember 30 minutes and 38 seconds ago when I talked about speed wall strafing? Where if you have a long straightaway with a wall you can hug the entire way, then by being against the wall and holding the directional key that's in the wall's direction and also looking in the direction opposite the wall, you consistently gain speed when you jump since you're kind of just nonstop air strafing with the wall holding you in place. If you have a long straightaway with a wall you can hug the entire way, then by being against the wall and holding the directional key that's in the wall's direction, and also looking in the direction opposite the wall, you consistently gain speed when you jump since you're kind of just non-stop air strafing with the wall holding you in place. Well, this level had a lot of it, and the next will have a fair bit as well. He's then going to ride this elevator up and watch as Caliban from Logan tries to keep up and gets crushed by some closing walls, but he's totally okay because he has about as much plot armor as Arya Stark. So this next level, Turret Factory, is normally super dark, but M Sushi has it set up so that this level is played with full bright on, which just means that brightness has increased a ton. More on that at the bottom of the description. At the start, he does what's called Flashlight Skip, where he portals up right away to go on top of Caliban's beam, which lets him jump over an invisible wall that would have blocked him otherwise while he waited for Caliban to turn on his flashlight. Because of the movement speed cap that I talked about earlier that makes bunny hopping a lot more control-based than speed-based, M Sushi's movement through this area is all routed out. Pretty much every run he knows exactly where he'll be landing and moving to, with it pretty much always being the same. The rest of this level is mainly a lot of bunny hopping and air strafing along the catwalks and conveyor belts, with a couple portals thrown in in the middle for quick maneuvering. All this hopping around got me googling, and in the process, I learned about something called Zhangxi, which, according to Wikipedia, are from Chinese folklore and are reanimated corpses that move around by hopping with their arms outstretched and kill living creatures by absorbing their chi. I don't know, I didn't know about those before and just wanted to share something I learned. So as we finish this level and head into the next, Turret Sabotage, let's do a real quick story recap. So Shell's been in storage for a bit, say somewhere between 50 years and something like 50,000 years. Caliban, aka Captain Deertz, freed us, but we ended up back in GLaDOS's clutches anyway. We and Deertz have both cheated death a few times by now, and our current goal is to remove GLaDOS from power for calling us fat and giving us malware. Anything would be better than keeping her in charge. In the story of the game, this mission consists of us tampering with the turret assembly line so that GLaDOS isn't able to utilize the turrets against us anymore. We aren't going to be doing that though, but again, the game doesn't check if story conditions are met between levels, so by completing the level it'll act like we sabotage the assembly regardless. The fastest way to progress through this level is usually to do a pancake shot into the windowed room across from us, but instead, M Sushi decided to show off a strat called the Turret Fly. He's going to snag this first reject turret out of the air once it gets launched from the assembly line and will then play 
place it in a specific spot and knock it over before heading back to yoink a second one. These turrets have really big square hitboxes that really don't like colliding with other objects, so after Randy mossing the second turret, he's going to stand on the first turret while holding the second one, look down so the hitboxes are colliding, and then jump, causing the turret he's holding to repel the one he's standing on upwards. On top of the level, he's able to hop around on the support beams and reach this walkway over here, which skips a lot of the level and again skips the sabotage of the assembly line. To get to the next level, he has to navigate through some offices back here, which he does while bringing along the new friend he made. We also get to spend this time listening to Deertz, aka Paris from Nomeo and Juliet, talk about how we should now make our way to take out GLaDOS's neurotoxin generator, and also hear his remarks about how horribly take your daughter to work day went, and how there's also potato batteries sitting around. Don't worry, I'm absolutely guaranteeing you 100% that it's this one. Okay, let's try this way. So Neurotoxin Sabotage is a relatively straightforward level. At the end of Portal 1, GLaDOS flooded her chamber with deadly Neurotoxin as we fought her, which served as a timer for the final challenge of the game, and the lingering threat of being neurologically turned into a potato is one of the driving forces behind completing the test chambers in this game. He's about to hop in an elevator and ride it up, and when he gets to the top, M. Sushi is going to press a button and shoot a portal so that a laser is reliably being fired into said portal. Past the button, he'll enter a door where he'll shoot a portal through a different door that doesn't have collision with portals so that the the laser is being fired into that room, and he'll then relocate said portal as needed to have the laser move around the room to destroy all the tubing in the neurotoxin production chamber. So whatever you're doing, hold on, Tonic, that did it! Neurotoxin at zero percent! Yes! Hold on. After M. Sushi pulls a hungry box as one final measure to make sure the generator is offline, to finish the level, he then has to wait and stare at Terry from Dream Corp LLC until the tube behind him ruptures from the pressure and sucks us both into it into the next level. This level is called Tube Ride, and is just that. It's just a cutscene level that leads us to the next one, and is just under a minute long, so while this plays out, I'd just like to say that I hope you're all doing well. If you're not, then I'd just like to remind you, as always, that no feeling is final. Your life is not defined by any feelings of despair, or dread, or guilt that you may have, and those feelings do not take away from you the fact that there is a tomorrow. There are brighter days ahead, and tomorrow is waiting for you. At some point, you'll be able to look back at what you're going through, and rather than it being a memory of who you are or were, it'll be a memory of where you were, because you are not defined by those feelings. Just please, always remember that there is a tomorrow. Getting back to the run, our ride on the London Underground is over, and we've now arrived at the final level of Chapter 5, Core, which is where we finally confront GLaDOS after all the preparation we just did. This level is like 99% auto-scroller, where after we get Wily Coyote'd here by this fake door, we're on rails for most of the mission as we're put into a glass box like we're the author of all her pain. GLaDOS is going to set up a bunch of turrets around us, which she's soon to find out are all defective, followed by her attempting to pump neurotoxin into our cell, only for Terry, aka Peter Ian Staker from Hot Fuzz, to come flying out and break the glass of our prison. From the ceiling. Well, it was nice catching up. Let's get to business. I hope you brought something stronger than a portal gun this time. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're about to become the immediate past president of the Being Alive Club. Haha. Uh -huh. Seriously, though. Goodbye. It's my big chance. This is trouble. <laughs> ah, not again. Here comes up. Locked and loaded. Ah, oh, this ain't good. Oh. You were busy back there. Well. I suppose we could just sit in this room and glare at each other until somebody drops dead. But I have a better idea. It's your old friend, Deadly Neurotoxin. If I were you, I'd take a deep breath and hold it. Hello. M. Sushi will now set up the core transfer process by putting Peter on the mainframe, with Peter agreeing to be transferred while GLaDOS refuses. This leads to the stalemate resolution button being presented for us to press, which M. Sushi will do quickly by shooting a portal behind it ASAP, and then jumping into a portal on the floor so that he gets to the button before GLaDOS can fully block it with fake walls. Substitute core, are you ready to start the procedure? Yes. Corrupted core, are you ready to start the procedure? No. Oh, yes she is. No, 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 no. Stalemate detected. 
Transfer procedure cannot continue. Yes. Unless a stalemate associate is present to press the stalemate resolution button. He'll then bunny hop around the room a bit to stretch his legs, but he will have to look at the center of the room to hit a look trigger so that the core transfer process can occur. And a little known fact, T-Pain actually has a voice cameo in this part. Are you just saying that or is it really going to hurt? You're just saying that, aren't you? You're just, no you're not, you are, it is going to hurt, isn't it? Exactly how painful are we to- ah! Get your hands off me. No, stop, no, no. Now that Neil from The Good Place is in charge, he's going to call an elevator for us so we can leave Aperture, and M. Sushi is going to stand behind where the elevator comes out of the ground from and jump on top of it as it comes up to begin the process of elevator skip. Jumping on top of it actually triggers the elevator to close from the bottom, making Neil think we're in the elevator. The elevator is going to start rising and there's actually an invisible wall surrounding the tube of the elevator, but it's not the tallest thing ever. So once the elevator gets to a certain height, M. Sushi is going to be able to jump over the invisible wall and then crawl into the elevator shaft under the invisible wall to skip the rest of the cutscene. Despite its simplicity, elevator skip is the biggest skip in the game, with it skipping around 2 minutes of cutscene. In this run, he was able to pull off a fun little strat called a hole-in-one where he's able to strafe cleanly into the elevator and begin his fall into the pit right away, rather than having to land on the ground and walk in. As we make our way to the good place, we get to hear Neil maniacally laughing up above, which is him turning into something far worse than a malevolent AI with absolute power. A total idiot with absolute power. It's like 2016 all over again. So the first level of the chapter is Long Fall, and is just us falling downwards, with GLaDOS now being one of those 40 potato batteries I mentioned earlier, so while this fall plays out, IT'S TIME FOR A QUIZ! That's right, it's time for the third ever quiz here on the Tomato Anus channel. I gave you a warning about it earlier, so no wah wah babies in the comments. The question is, what's the difference between a re-portal and a portal stand? Is it A, re-portals are shooting a portal as you pass through a portal while your camera is on the other side but your core position isn't, while portal stands are you standing still in a portal while shooting a new one. B, re-portals are shooting a portal while in a portal for a speed boost, while with portal stands you fight against the boost to stay in place while the portal relocates. C, they're the same exact thing, the names are just interchangeable. Or D, re-portals are shooting a portal while in a portal for a speed boost, while portal stands are you getting stuck in place while standing and shooting a ton of portals to get a huge speed boost. 10 seconds on the clock, leave your answers in the comments now. If you said C, then wait, no, I mean if you said A, then you're wrong. If you said C, then wait, no, I mean if you said D, then you're still wrong. The answer is B. So we're now arriving to the first real level of Chapter 6, Underground. We awaken in this level to Spuds McKenzie being stolen by a crow, and worth noting that M. Sushi has Fulbright on for this level as well, so that you at home can easily see what's going on. This level is a relatively straightforward one, where after bunny hopping for a moment, he portals to the other side of a fence that's blocking the path. He then portals again to be able to shoot another one way up across the level. He's then going to portal down to some do not enter and keep out signs, where he'll hop onto a sign there, and then onto some debris on the left to gain line of sight to a wall way across the level that he shoots a portal to. This will bring him to a massive vault door that he needs to open to go to the next level, but to do so, he needs to press two buttons in rapid succession like he's Dylan activating the overtime contingency. This, uh, isn't too hard when you can kinda be two places at once with a portal gun. He then has to wait around 20 seconds before the vault door will fully open and the area behind it loads, so he's going to spend this time just kinda messing around a little and then shooting a portal way up high to the side of the vault door. Up here, he jumps onto some stuff sticking out of the wall and then jumps down to the vault door as it opens up, so that way he doesn't have to wait for platforms and stuff to open up to be able to progress. Once the monolithic vault door fully opens and the area loads in, rather than finding Nick Valentine, MC she finds a smaller, regular door leading to the next level. Cave Johnson is usually where we're introduced to J.K. Simmons, aka Mac McGuff from Juno, but M. Sushi is going to skip enough of the level that Mac's dialogue isn't heard, and here he performs a cliff shot where he's able to jump and move in air to peek around a cliff to shoot a portal on a wall behind it and move back in air to land on solid ground. He's then going to perform something called scripted momentum abuse. So this is a topic that M. Sushi has an entire video covering on his channel, but in short, the game will often have triggers in locations where you're supposed to be flung, where if your speed isn't just right, it corrects your speed so that you won't miss the landing point. These are called scripted momentum triggers. They're typically more of a correction thing though, where say you're moving just too slow, then the game gives you a little help to make sure you make the fling. 
It's not something where you can just walk through the portal and get flung. Like I said, it's more for slight corrections than anything else. In this level, there's a fling where we're supposed to fly out of a portal on this sloped face all the way to this catwalk here. For some reason though, when he sets up the portal on the sloped face and then shoots the other portal at a specific angle, when he goes through, the trigger will cause him to accelerate to the required fling speed, even though it shouldn't. In addition to this, he's going to perform a reportal as he passes through to get more speed, which will let him overshoot the landing catwalk and jump slash bounce to the catwalk to its right, which is where the exit of the level is. This next level is where we're introduced to a new mechanic in the game, Repulsion Gel. Repulsion Gel is blue and bouncy, makes you go real high. We finally get to hear the voice of J. Jonah Jameson now, and in this first chamber of the level, M. Sushi will portal up to a ledge where he'll line up a seam shot to shoot a portal outside of the chamber's exit, letting him ride to the next one in the level. In the next chamber, he's going to use the Repulsion Gel to get up to a floor button where he's going to perform a glitch called Step Dad to open up a panel he'll use to bounce to the end of the chamber. The old aperture buttons are weird, where if you step on it for one tick, then off it for one tick, and then on it for one tick again, you activate the button permanently without needing to put a cube on it, and the glitch has the name it does since it was originally performed by pressing DAD on the keyboard. And speaking of stepdads, I wanted to take a moment to say hi to my stepdad. Hi John. Stepdad skips getting the cube in that chamber and saves around 3 or 4 seconds. We haven't entirely nailed down what element it is yet, but I'll tell you this, it's a lively one, and it does not like the human skeleton. To start bomb flings, M. Sushi does some bunny hops and is able to make it to the fallen Eiffel Tower to span the sludgy floor. He'll then shoot a portal up above where he'll portal stand to reach and activate a pedestal button. He'll then portal stand again and re-portal out of it to reach a ledge where he'll shoot a portal on a sloped face. He'll shoot a portal under the repulsion gel as it falls so it shoots out of the sloped surface he shot his orange portal on, and will shoot a portal under himself as he falls, look up as he passes through, and follow the repulsion gel on its path, letting him bounce off where it landed to reach the exit. The reason he looks up at around a 15 to 20 degree angle when he passes through the floor portal is because for some reason when you pass through a slanted portal like he did to get launched as he followed the repulsion gel, you experience something called angle decay where your vertical view angle gradually decreases and you look downwards. This is bad because he's about to perform what's called view snap where by pressing a hotkey to change his game sensitivity to be super high and hardware sensitivity to be super low, he can move his mouse exactly one unit on a system level which moves his camera an exact distance in game with the high sensitivity. He does this so that he can get his camera angle just right so that he's able to line up a seam shot right here, followed by him swapping back to his normal sensitivity and jumping underneath the cube's glass prison to break the glass. After rescuing the cube and placing it on the button, he drops from a portal he placed up high to build momentum to fling himself to the exit. Before exiting, he waits until the yellow M&M gets to a point in his dialogue where he says safety door, after which M. Sushi will step into the elevator. Why not invent a special safety door that won't hit you on the butt on the way out? Because you are fired! Not you, test subject. You're doing fine. Yes, you. Box your stuff. Out the front door. Parking lot. Car. Goodbye. As he rides up, he'll shoot a portal to a wall on the left, and something worth mentioning in this game is the portal helper. If you try and shoot in a specific place, the game has an almost magnetic pull, so the portal is applied where the devs intended, like the portal landing on the other side of the glass here despite M. Sushi shooting it to the right of the glass. This is the portal helper. Most instances are benign and unnoticeable, but it was pretty egregious there. After flipping the two switches, he's able to go into the cavern here where he'll shoot a portal up on the wall to re-portal through to fall and gain momentum, and after dropping through it, he'll turn around in air to shoot a portal higher up on the wall, then one on the floor so he gets enough of a launch to land above the elevator, letting him ramp up the level. When we load into Propulsion Intro, we'll be reunited with Mrs. Potato Head, despite us skipping picking her up last level, since I'm not sure if you know this, but the game doesn't check story conditions between levels. After shooting a portal here, M. Sushi lines up a portal shot across the level through a hole in a texture. Please note that this isn't a seam shot. As he goes through the portal, he does a re-portal to launch himself to the end of the level and bunny hop to the elevator. That's it. That's the level. After he delays entering the elevator, of course. Worth mentioning, GLaDOS is eager to be with us since she's a starch proponent of testing and also wants to lay her eyes on old Aperture. It's at this point in the game that GLaDOS swears that she recognizes the voice of and knows Omni-Man as she hears his dialogue play out over the level. You're supposed to learn how to use Propulsion and Repulsion Gel together in this level, but we're actually not going to use Propulsion Gel at all in the entire speedrun despite it making you move faster. 
Instead, M. Sushi portals across the level where he then shoots a new portal and taps W to get the perfect distance away from the wall to become temporarily stuck, and then fires eight portals to perform another super re-portal, which launches him to the exit. And just to recap the two gels so far for anyone unfamiliar, Repulsion Gel makes you bounce, blue is bouncy, while Propulsion Gel makes you speed up and go fast on it. Orange is... Like you say when you accelerate really fast, but in a scary way. So conversion intro is where we get to hear Fletcher from Whiplash's famous lemon rant, but M. Sushi is going to perform what's called Lemonade Skip, which skips said rant. He's going to make his way to a sloped surface he's supposed to launch off of, which has a scripted momentum trigger tied to it, which is actually bad in this case since he wants to do a super reportal off the sloped surface, and the trigger makes it so that you can't super reportal without getting launched in a way that you don't want. However, by placing his blue portal so that the bottom of it is touching the sloped surface and crouch walking through the portal, Portal, the trigger is disabled, which lets him then quickly fire some portals and position himself to get stuck again, as you can see by Shell's leg sticking out above us. He fires 10 portals to build up the speed and blast off, deflecting off a pipe here which launches him perfectly up to the exit catwalk. This is a bummer for all you Lemon Rant enjoyers, I understand, and luckily, so does M. Sushi, so he chose to drop down here and play through the level as intended so you all can hear the Lemon Rant again. The completion of the rest of the level is, as I said, largely as intended, just really fast and efficient thanks to the use of things like re-portals. As part of this level's completion, we do get to see the first use of Conversion Gel. For those unfamiliar, Conversion Gel converts any surface into one you can shoot a portal on. So to recap, White Gel makes walls, Blue Gel makes bouncy, and Orange makes... <clears throat> I, um, I'll just let the lemon rant play out now. Anyway, ground them up, mix them into a gel. And guess what? Ground up moon rocks are pure poison. I am deathly ill. Still, it turns out they're a great portal conductor. So now, we're gonna see if jumping in and out of these new portals can somehow leach the lunar poison out of our right, man's bloodstream. When life gives you lemons, make don't make lemonade. Yeah. Make life take the lemons back. Yeah. Get mad! Yeah. I don't want your damn lemons! What am I supposed to do with these? Yeah, take the lemons. Demand to see life's manager. Yeah. Make life rue the day it thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons. Do you know who I am? I'm the man who's gonna burn your house down with the lemons. Oh, I like this guy. I'm gonna get my so we're now on to the final level of the chapter, Three Gels. After shooting a portal way up there, M. Sushi will launch himself onto a platform where he'll line up his portal in a specific spot with the repulsion gel. He's then going to do what's called a stuck launch, where by getting between two pieces of geometry like this railing and pipe, he builds up speed like he's falling freely, as you can see in the top left with his vertical velocity, but he's held in place by the geometry like they're rubber bands. He shot that portal in the specific spot with the repulsion gel so that it gathers perfectly below him, and once he breaks free from the rubber bands, he'll slam into the repulsion gel and use all this speed to bounce to almost the end, where he'll shoot a portal and slope off a tube on the way down so he can redirect himself into a portal he shoots on the ground to launch himself to a button at the end of the level. After pressing the button, he has to look at this poster with paradoxes on it to progress some dialogue, otherwise he'd have to wait a little bit, and he then jumps off and goes through a portal. Now the vault in the ceiling will open, and we'd normally have to wait for a catwalk to come all the way down for us to ride up, but he'll skip it by doing another super re-portal by setting up this lineup, shooting a portal against the wall by this railing, and then going back through to do another lineup and shoot some portals to get stuck. He then fires a bunch of portals to build up speed and launch himself into the vault door, skipping the catwalk ride and saving over a minute. He then just has to bunny hop to the elevator that's waiting for him up here, where he can then ride from Chapter 7 to Chapter 8, The Itch. So we're now returning to Aperture Labs to find it's under new management, Stephen Merchant from Lip Sync Battle, aka Gregory Dillard from The Outlaws. Gregory now has an itch to test that comes with the territory of being in charge of the facility, and he's been trying to perform tests without us by creating cube turret amalgamations and trying to get them to walk onto buttons, but they're actually set up in the game's code to be unable to walk onto buttons. One time though, Portal Runner can't even, might have heard of him, had a freak occurrence where the Franken turrets pushed each other onto the button which softlocked the game. Normally there's a 50 second dialogue in this room up here where we speak with Gregory and GLaDOS risks herself by saying a paradox to him, which he simply just agrees with, foiling the plan since he is, uh, not great at logic. 
Um, Sushi completely skips this dialogue though by throwing a franken turret onto the button here while doing the laser switch glitch, which lets him bypass the panels that Gregory tries to put up to stop him from leaving to start the dialogue. After some catwalk movement here, he's going to have to ride an elevator up and into Gregory's attempt at creating a test chamber. As GLaDOS puts it though, Gregory knows about as much about test building as he does about logical contradictions, so the test chamber really is, for lack of a better term, horseshit. It only consists of pressing a pedestal button to drop a cube on a button and portaling up to the exit, which M Sushi does super quickly here. Good morning. Core overheating. Nuclear design this tent. He has to wait a moment in the exit hall before being able to progress, so he kills some time by building up enough speed with a couple bunny hops to break Franz Balder from the girl on the spiderweb's monitor. Franz opens up some panels for us to solve the test chamber again to see if it'll satiate his itch, but after M. Sushi only scratches the spot for a couple seconds, Franz resolves to let him move on to the next chamber. He then does a minor time save here by passing through the fizzler at a certain point in Franz's dialogue, which skips just like the last syllable of his line, saving around half a second or so. To end the chamber, he then has to wait for GLaDOS to say the word kill, at which point he walks into the elevator to time out the elevator transition. So this next chamber is where Portal 2 turns into control thanks to a glitch called the Excursion Funnel Crouch Fly Glitch, or CFG for short, which is the most broken glitch in the game. There are blue tractor beams introduced in this chamber which are called Excursion Funnels, and when the player or an object is placed in one, they're pulled slash float in the direction the funnel is flowing. The way it's implemented is in the game, there's an internal counter for how many funnels you're in. If you're in one or greater, the player is given zero gravity, and if you're in zero, the player has normal gravity. For whatever reason though, if you crouch and come to a complete stop while in an excursion funnel, the game increments the counter for how many you're in. So in this level for example, M. Sushi is going to crouch on top of his orange portal without the blue one active, and then shoot the blue one above an excursion funnel so that the orange portal opens and the funnel flows through the portals with him crouched inside of it. Although he's only in one funnel, the game's internal counter is set to him being inside of two funnels, and when he then leaves the funnel, the game's counter reduces by one since he left the funnel, so the counter is still at one. Since the game thinks he's in a funnel, he maintains the zero gravity of being inside of one, so he's able to fly around the level freely. The first thing to mention about how flying around like this works is that you only have zero gravity while you're in the air. If you have the glitch active and have your feet touch or touching the ground, you run around on the ground like normal. The instant that you jump or leave the ground though, the zero gravity kicks in. While you're in the air, you're able to use your camera and directional keys to move around and steer horizontally, but vertically, you truly have zero gravity. Your vertical movement is entirely based on momentum and redirecting off of things. So like for example, if the glitch is active and you're running around on the ground and then jump, then you have zero gravity and will just move upwards with the initial momentum from when you jumped until you bonk your head on something to redirect you or you get stuck on the ceiling like a sad balloon. Because of this, use of the glitch is meticulously routed so that runners don't accidentally get themselves stuck somewhere on a ceiling where they have no way to redirect themselves downward. There are many ways you can get soft locked with this glitch. The glitch is preserved between levels, meaning you can set it up in one chamber, walk into the elevator, arrive at the next chamber, and then jump and start flying away. The only ways to cancel it is to enter another excursion funnel, without crouching of course, or if you're in the same level as the one you set up the glitch in, staying crouched when and after you set it up and then uncrouching. In other words, if you're flying while crouched in the chamber you set it up in and uncrouch, then you stop flying. So when M. Sushi goes to set up CFG in this chamber, after crouching on the orange portal and shooting the blue portal above the funnel, he'll shoot a new portal, which will cause him to relocate to the ceiling where the blue portal was. This is because when he shoots this new portal, similar to with Pika portal, his core position is actually on the other side of the blue portal, so his camera is relocated once the new portal is opened. Alright, think that's all about CFG for now. Oh, aside from the fact that CFG was found on the day the game was released. Alright, everything's good, I just invented some more tests. After setting up CFG, M. Sushi grabs the Franken turret and tosses it into the funnel towards the orange portal, then opens some new blue portals below so the Franken turret is carried up to press the button so he can leave the level. Now that he's on the floor, he's able to walk around normally, but again, as soon as he jumps, he'll have no gravity, so he's avoiding bunny hopping for now. In ceiling button, M. Sushi circle jumps to get flying, shoots a portal below a button on the ceiling, presses a pedestal button to drop a franken turret, grabs said franken turret, presses it against the button to activate some dialogue, places it on the floor portal, and shoots a blue portal on the wall of a funnel so that the funnel travels through and lifts the franken turret to press the button. <sighs> that was a mouthful. You may be remarking, wow, these past two chambers seem surprisingly competent for Hugh from fighting with my family to have made, and you'd be correct to remark that, because Hugh is actually now using tests that GLaDOS has made and passing them off as his own. As GLaDOS notes, this is bad, because her tests can actually kill you. 
She just remarked that she didn't stockpile chambers or anything, so Hugh should run out of chambers soon, only for Hugh to note that he, uh, actually just found a full wing of stockpiled chambers. So Wallbutton has a large, insurmountable chasm laid out before us, so whatever will M. Sushi do? Oh, that's right, he's Sanji and can just kick the air to walk on it. After pressing this pedestal button and grabbing the Franken turret that drops, he'll go through a portal he shoots on the wall here so he can fly out of the portal he shot on the other side of the chasm, where after making sure the Franken turret is oriented properly, he'll toss it up to no-scope the button on the wall above, letting him use the laser switch glitch to leave the level. It's around now that GLaDOS is realizing, oh no, the facility is legitimately on the brink of collapse, and unless they stop Hugh soon, then they'll be destroyed with it, so she devises the plan of us continuing to test while she looks for a way out. So some of you might be thinking that being able to fly is like hitting the win button, and that is just simply not the case, except it's totally true in polarity, since right here he positions a funnel to give him the little lift he needs to make it to the already open exit. This comes at the cost of CFG getting cancelled, which, oh no, whatever will we do? It's not like we have a device in our hands that can literally bend the reality of space. That was sarcasm, by the way. In Funnel Catch, M. Sushi is going to shoot a portal high up on a wall and do a portal stand in it as he does what's called a portal cut. This is where he shoots a portal onto a small surface that portals can land on that's surrounded by a surface portal shouldn't be able to land on, such as the graded surface across the level. This causes the portal to cut into the surface it shouldn't be allowed on, like right here where the portal is on the other side of the grate, which M. Sushi pushes the Franken turret and himself through here to reach the end, where he tosses the Franken turret onto the button to wrap up the level. The longest part of this level is the long dialogue sequence at the end with Rumpelspudskin, I mean GLaDOS, where she tells us that her old body slash Higgins for Modern Family's body has a built-in euphoric response to testing, but you build up a tolerance over time unless you have the mental capacity to push past it. Unfortunately, Higgins does not, so he's starting to get frustrated. In Stop the Box, M. Sushi is going to press a pedestal button to drop a Franken turret and shoot portals to redirect a light bridge to block himself and the Franken turret after he launches himself here to grab it in midair. Moving the old test chamber a little bit closer to me, um, I don't thought maybe proximity to after rounding this corner and dropping the Franken turret on the button, he then portals back up to the walkway above, where he's able to then casually bunny hop to the exit. He's still not scratching the itch that Paris from Sherlock Gnomes has, so Paris is just getting more and more frustrated and maybe even desperate. And no, I did not use Paris from Sherlock Gnomes already. I used Paris from Gnomeo and Juliet. Different films, different cinema, different art. So to start Laser Catapult, M. Sushi is going to do a portal stand to navigate across the level real quick to an excursion funnel where he'll set up CFG again. Tape you solving these and then watch 10 at once. Get a more sort of concentrated burst of Once he has it set up, he strafes over to and launches himself off of a slope surface to soar to new heights where he bounces off this pipe which redirects him at just the right angle to reach the floor at the exit. GLaDOS then divulges in this moment that the facility is collapsing due to the fact that Man with Broken Leg from Run Fat Boy Run was designed to make bad decisions and has decided to not maintain any of the crucial functions required to keep the facility running. Something I failed to mention so far is what's called a portal bump, where if you shoot a portal on top of another portal, the second one is bumped to the left or right even if the surface isn't entirely portalable, which he does here to get his orange portal on the sign to save a fraction of a second of walking. After pressing this button and grabbing the redirection cube, he brings it near the exit where he shot an orange portal to a portal helper location, which is the perfect height where if you drop the redirection cube, it perfectly slopes off the portal edge for the laser to hit the receiver. Rather than use the funnel to reach the next level, since the elevator is out of service, M. Sushi uses his still active CFG to strafe through the air alongside the funnel and clips the funnel at the end to cancel CFG and drop down to a catwalk below, which is only possible thanks to the fact he's invincible from Bet's Rider. If you weren't invincible and tried to do this, you'd hit a kill trigger as you fell that would kill you instantly. In Propulsion Catch, M. Sushi portals over immediately to press a pedestal button to drop a Franken turret onto a walkway and then stands on a button and redirects a funnel with some portals to push the Franken turret over to him to grab and place on the button. He'll then set up the funnel to be shooting into a wall near him at ground level, which he crouches in and walks out of to set up CFG again, but stays crouched when doing so. This is because he's going to fly to the exit, but he'll have upward momentum, so he's going to uncrouch to cancel the glitch because, again, if you stay crouched after setting the glitch up and then uncrouch while in the same chamber you set it up in, the glitch is cancelled. Also, when he was flying, you could see Peabody be the little rascal he is and scamper away, which is a little easter egg hinting at how Gary from Hall Pass is working on replacing us with robots so he can test endlessly to forever scratch that itch. Rewind to watch that part again and see it, I guess. Uh, give me that audience retention. I think that's how it works. Just don't get caught in an endless loop of getting back to this point and rewinding again because I told you to. 
Anyways, Gary also tells us here that he has a big surprise waiting for us. Whatever could it be? To start this level, Gary is going to just eviscerate the path we're on, causing a bunch of conversion gel to spill everywhere that M Sushi uses to quickly portal to the other side of the gap. Bunch of fingers. Here he crouches as he portals into the edge of the funnel above, letting him set up CFG again, which he takes advantage of after portaling across the level here to quickly fly to the exit. When he gets to the exit room, he uses portals to save like 3 feet of walking, which just exemplifies exactly what I would use a portal gun for in real life. So the next level is the start of the final chapter, the part where, which actually has a longer name that's revealed when we get the title card. Title card. We're going to be skipping the moment where we get the title card though. This level starts with a trap where we're supposed to step on a faith plate to launch forward, but instead it would just launch us to the right through a hole in the wall that Roger Fairweather from Short Poppies opens up. But that hole doesn't actually have collision, so M Sushi can just fly straight through it from the get-go after hitting his head on a pixel walk to stop his upward momentum. This part is then mostly just air strafing and speed wall strafing while flying, which up ahead will bring us to Roger's Crusher Trap, where he's going to be so stunned that he sees Shell flying that he'll be at a loss for words and not say anything. M Sushi will even hit his head off the corner of Roger's monitor, which still doesn't prompt a reaction. After landing and going through this door up here, he's going to jump back up and ride along the bottom side of a catwalk, using the end of it to slope himself downwards back onto the ground. After rounding this corner, a crusher trap is going to jump scare us, but M Sushi can just fly through and has the perfect speed to not get hit by it as it crushes in or collapses back out. To start the next level, you typically have to wait around 30 seconds for a test chamber to move into place, but M Sushi possesses the almighty power of flight, letting him fly around an invisible wall and through the moving chamber as it only has collision once it stops. Through this door, he's able to fly past a turret trap, and he'll then use the underside of a catwalk stairway to redirect himself downwards to the catwalk across the room, skipping a part of the level that involves a funnel puzzle. Once he lands, he'll continue down the path where a gel pipe will collapse and break part of the catwalk, but we don't really need floors, so it's not a big deal. He's then going to pass by a ton of turrets, which is the part of the game where invincibility comes in handy most, but it's not really required to be invincible for it. It's more of a quality of life thing with not having to worry about being killed by them, especially this late into the run. After then using the portals how I would, he wraps up the level to bring himself to Finale 3. He's going to portal bump his portal onto the other side of the closed door right at the start here, saving the 0.4 seconds of the door opening. He then just flies up to a portal surface above to skip having to activate things, which brings him to the death conveyor belt room where Claude from Good Boys would try to trap him. Instead, he's again able to fly up to a portal surface to skip the involved puzzles. He'll fly through a wall without collision up ahead that's supposed to break, and slope off some objects in the environment to have the proper height through the rest of this flight. Here he uses the funnel to lose CFG, and then he'll portal up above when he goes through this door to get to the final level of the run. Once he bunny hops through here to arrive at the panel he'll ride up, there's a good minute or so of cutscene that he has to sit through where Claude talks at him. While Claude does that, I just want to give a huge thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. This video truly would not have happened without you. Like I said at the start of this video, this run was actually suggested and voted on by my patrons to be covered on the channel. We do this for hitting patron milestone goals, with this one being for hitting 300 patrons, and we're almost at 350 now, and if we end up hitting that, then we'll do another patron's choice speedrun explained. This is where patrons are able to suggest up to two speedruns to be covered on the channel, and then all the submissions are compiled into a poll for everyone to vote on, with the winner then being featured in a video. This is the third time we've done this, with the previous two choices being the Hitman 2016 and Subnautica runs you can find on the channel. In addition to these polls, I also host similar polls for every 25 patron milestone, where patrons vote on a list of speedruns that I've chosen, with the winner then being turned into a speedrun explained. In addition to these perks for being a patron, for as little as $1 a month, you get access to videos early, updates on what videos are being made, ad-free versions of videos, and access to patron-exclusive livestream Q&As that I do for every 50 patrons. Supporting the channel monetarily is entirely unnecessary, yet so many of you do it anyways, so again, thank you to those of you who support the channel on Patreon. Back to the run, the main thing to this boss fight is what's called bomb juggling. 
We have to hit Wheatley from Portal 2 three times with bombs in order to beat him, with each hit stunning him for you to put a corrupted core on him. After tricking Wheatley into breaking the tube to flood the chamber with conversion gel, he'll shoot three bombs in a rally at M Sushi. So M Sushi is going to use portals to hit him with the first bomb, then use portals to keep the other two in the air to use as the remaining bombs he needs to hurt Wheatley. Normally, after each time you stun him and put a core on him, you have to wait for him to shoot out more bombs to use on him. But with bomb juggling, you can just keep the initial bombs in the air so you don't have to wait for him to shoot out more each time. After tossing the first core onto Wheatley and getting a little sniff of the neurotoxin, M Sushi waits for Wheatley to wake up for being stunned in cord, and as soon as he wakes up, M Sushi shoots a portal below him to hit him with a bomb before then correcting his portal location to keep juggling the last bomb. He then bounces off the repulsion gel to the next corrupted core location, and as soon as he has his hands on it, he slaps it onto Wheatley. He then chose to slightly adjust a portal location to make sure that the bomb keeps in the air and on a cycle where it'll hit Wheatley as soon as he wakes up, which M Sushi did perfectly here. Uncertainty emergency preemption protocol initiated. This facility will self-destruct in two minutes. Enough! I told you not to pass! He then starts gaining a bunch of momentum, so he's able to fling himself upwards right here, right when the third corrupted core spawns in, which he grabs out of air and attaches to Wheatley, which about wraps up the boss fight. There's still a little more though, so just wait. We now go through exactly what happened with GLaDOS earlier in the game with the transfer process beginning, and us having to press the stalemate button to complete the transfer and put GLaDOS back in charge. Turns out, though, that despite his lacking logic abilities, Wheatley booby-trapped the stalemate button, so when we press it, we'll get blown back. In our disoriented state, though, we'll be able to shoot the moon, since conversion gel is made of moon rocks, with the vacuum of space sucking Wheatley into the void. As the conversion gel in the room gets washed away, M Sushi shoots a portal between two patches, which lets it stay in place when the gel disappears. M Sushi is going to do what's called early moon shot, where he then shoots a portal into the stalemate associate room and presses the button, where he's able to spam portals at the ceiling of Wheatley's room, which lets him shoot a portal to the moon in a 0.1 second window between when you're first able to shoot through the ceiling and when the explosion happens to initiate the cutscene. This saves around 16 seconds and is also the end of the speedrun, but also bugs out the end cutscene a little with you getting warped back to the room after being in space when the game thinks you should be able to first shoot the moon, and then getting put back on the moon with Shell's hands holding onto Wheatley and, uh, some third appendage holding onto the portal gun. Also worth noting, at the start of the video I talked about shooting portals in Portal 2 being hit scanned, but shooting the moon is actually the one time in the game where the portal shot has linear travel time. This about wraps up the run though. Minnesota guy? Minnesota guy? Minnesota guy? Huh, the sinkhole must have led to the ceiling. Anyway, where were we? We were talking about War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Right, with one of the most dynamic and detailed vehicle damage models in gaming. How could I forget? You might have missed it, but I was talking about how you can play War Thunder on PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, and previous console generations. Did you talk about how if you register with the link in the description, you get a large free bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and more? Yeah, I said that too. Cool. So if you made it this far in the video, thank you so much on behalf of both M Sushi and myself. And additionally, thank you so much to M Sushi for helping make this video. I got so much enjoyment out of being able to work with him, and being able to talk to him about the run and learn from him about it all was just a treat. If you haven't already, please do check out M Sushi's channels. He streams portal runs occasionally on Twitch and has a ton of videos on his YouTube channel breaking down crazy stuff in the portal games. Links are in the description. Also, if you'd like to learn more about portal speedruns or source engine runs in general, then head on over to sourceruns.org. It's a community-ran site dedicated to source games, complete with their own YouTube channel dedicated to showing off the amazing stuff they figure out. Links to their stuff are also in the description. Lastly, please be sure to check out the Tomato Anus Discord server. It's a super welcoming, mellow, and supportive server where you can talk about whatever and just chill with some cool folks. New faces are always welcome and appreciated. That's all for this video though. This was an any% percent no SLA speedrun of Portal 2, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day. Motherfucker.